Grace and mercy and peace are yours from God our Father and from our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. The words of scripture for us to consider today, this Trinity Sunday, they're found in Matthew chapter 28, verses 16 through 20, oftentimes referred to as the Great Commission. Jesus gives his followers, including you and me, a task to do before he ascended into heaven, something we are to continue doing down through this day and into the future. The 11 disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had directed them. When they saw him, they worshiped him, but some hesitated because they were uncertain. Jesus approached and spoke to them saying, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore go, and gather disciples from all nations by baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and by teaching them to keep all the instructions I have given you. And surely I am with you always until the end of the age. This is the Gospel of our Lord. Dear brothers, and, and sisters in Christ Jesus. To be very honest with you, I found it harder to prepare a sermon this week than it usually is. If you were here last Sunday or saw the video of the sermon from last week, you know I briefly alluded to the murder of George Floyd in last week's sermon, but the crisis has continued, and the crisis of this complicated situation requires now more than just a passing reference. Early in the week, like I always do, I studied the text and prepared what I wanted to say and thought I was ready, and then I reread it, and I watched a few videos shared by fellow Christians, uh, actually from Milwaukee, who shared their perspective on the current situation. The black men I have never met, but men who are brothers in the faith, fellow Christians, and also leaders in their churches and their schools. I, I hope you will take the time to, to see those videos if you're follow me on Facebook, um, and follow the church on Facebook, you could easily find them. I'm not going to repeat the words that those men shared, I'll let them speak for themselves, but the words they shared brought me personally to repentance. Repentance for the anger in my heart at this situation and others, uh, the silence when I should have defended the helpless. Their, their words reminded me, though, above all. Above all, as they brought me to repentance, they reminded me that God's answer in this crisis remains the same. Yes, it is the same answer that I preached about last Sunday. The Pentecost gospel is the answer, the death and resurrection of Christ Jesus our Lord. That remains the answer today. So, having considered those words shared by the other people, I, I revamped it and reworded my sermon and thought about how to take these words on the Great Commission from Matthew chapter 28 and also let them present the truth of the gospel while at the same time answer the crisis in which we recognize existing in our country. We're going to consider these words. We're just recognizing Jesus' command to gather disciples from all nations. Jesus himself said it. An authoritative command after he had said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. He said, therefore, go and gather disciples from all nations. 
what's the authority he has to, to make such a command of you and me? Well, let's just review a little bit of that. He is the creator God. We heard about that in the first lesson from the Old Testament, Genesis, chap Genesis chapter 1, that in, we heard about that work, that, that, that he, he made the sun that heats the temperatures to uh, above 100 degrees. And at the same time is the one who, who is control of the, the Alaskan glaciers and, and the frozen tundra of the north in winter. He made trillions and even more than that innumerable tiny ants. And at the same time, made the powerful and large elephant and the intricate human beings, human beings of every race. Yes, Jesus was there at creation, and through him all things were made. And he rules with the Father and the Holy Spirit. As we pray today, we confess in our prayer, one God forever and ever. This Jesus, with all of that power and all of that authority, loved all nations. And out of love for all nations, Jesus came to earth. All nations includes all people. And do I have to, I, I do at this day, need to be more specific. All nations includes people of color. It means black lives matter to God. Black lives matter to Christians. They matter to me as well. Because they need Jesus as much as I need Jesus. As my brother Christians stated clearly in those two videos that I, that I watched. And again, I encourage you to look those up and speak to me after church or contact me if you want those direct links to those presentations. And as I think about what matters to God, that all nations matter to him. We also recognize that the Lord of creation, with all the authority he has, has placed all of us where we are today. You and me. In this church building, watching the video at home, wherever we are, God has placed us here to love. And that sharing of love does include the tough love, the, the pointing out of sin. But to do that effectively, I will listen to individuals before I respond to them. Which is why I think I had to rewrite quite a bit of my sermon after I listened to the words that were shared in, in that video. And that includes understanding the situation, recognizing the history of the nation in which we live, while offering many blessings that you and I benefit from in this nation, even the lowest of economic status to the highest of economic status can recognize there are blessings God gives us here. At the same time, our nation's history is also full of sin and its effects. Men have marginalized minorities. Hatred has filled hearts and led to murder. Injustice boils over into rioting. And we want to repay evil with evil. Sin gives birth to sin. The first sin and the responding sin, the answering sin, they both bring death. In God's rule and justice, he says, Every living soul belongs to me. The Father as well as the Son both alike belong to me. The soul who sins is the one who will die. Seeing myself in this world around me, I also see the bar of holiness that God sets, perfection, being like Him. And it's not just right here. If I train hard enough, I might be able to jump this high. But it's out of my reach to obtain 
holiness. In fact, that bar of holiness is so high that it might lead me to give up entirely, throw up our hands, wonder, well then, who could possibly have peace with God? And if we can't have peace with God, how could there be any hope of peace between people on earth? You see, God, God uses these current events to bring us to a desperate realization of, of just how much we do need Him. We need Him because Jesus also grants pardon. He came to earth to forgive terrified sinners, forgive terrified sinners who looked up to the bar of holiness and knew we could not get there. And Jesus says, I'm lifting you over that bar out of love. How did he do it? Jesus suffered injustice. Jesus experienced a lynching at the hands of his own people with the full support of his government, encouraging and approving of that lynching. And Jesus experienced literally being choked out at his crucifixion. He paid for the sins of those who caused him harm. I don't know. I don't know what George Floyd experienced. But Jesus did. Jesus knew what he experienced. Jesus knew what he experienced and went through it for him and for us. And based on that work, that suffering in the place of the sins of the world, Jesus commands you and me, therefore, go and gather disciples from all nations. And so as you hear those words, remember that Jesus has the authority to forgive sins. He proved that by his resurrection, Beyond any shadow of a doubt and what joy we have in celebrating that truth of the resurrection because it means that our sins are forgiven. That Christ did indeed suffer and die and, and experience the worst injustice of all, but that death could not hold him because he is the resurrection and the life. He is the one who told his disciples, if you forgive anyone their sins, they are forgiven. See, Jesus forgives so that we too can forgive. And that is an indispensable part of the answer to this crisis. Forgive so that we can forgive. In a small way, I must confess, in a very small way to some degree. Racism has affected my family. Many of you know my family as well. My daughter, on the day of her baptism, she couldn't understand anything yet, but she was referred to as it. To hear her peers commenting, an explanation of why her peers didn't feel like they could include her I don't know how to interact with her because she is black. Anger. Anger is the first response. And so I can understand with my mind the response of the protesters. I can understand with my mind even the rioting that goes on, though I have not even begun to experience the depth of what some have experienced in our nation. But anger is not the answer. Sin gives birth to sin, and it only gets worse. So interesting in that video the, the, that was shared, uh, that, I, that I mentioned, that I watched, the, the three black men said they could not even watch that video of Floyd being killed because they knew how much anger it would build up in their heart. They chose not to go there and deal with it another way. So anger is not the issue. I also know that I've 
held my tongue, maybe at times when I should have spoken. Silence when others suffer unjustly is not the answer either. And so, now, people in our nation are taking action. Peaceful demonstrations are held to promote justice and influence positive changes, a noble goal. Yet sin crouches at the door even there. And we see the destruction that results when anger is at the heart and boils over. We also pray for our government. We want to work for better laws. We strive for opportunities to lift up the downtrodden. And I'm not here to tell you what those opportunities are, but you do know to look for them. I encourage you to do your best with those prayers and those attempts to better laws and supporting good society. Yet at the same time, Every human response to this sin, even changes and better laws, good and noble laws that may improve social quality and our equality in our nation, they will not be perfect. Lofty goals they are, and yes, please continue to work for them, but do not expect heaven on earth. How many positive changes have occurred in the more than 150 years since slavery was abolished in this nation, and yet we find ourselves where we are today. What sin is out there, it continues in this world. And so, how do we respond? Do we throw up our hands and say the bar of that is too high? We recognize that we are forgiven, and so we will forgive. We will be people of peace, even if this world is full of hate. What's your circle of influence? Be a person of peace there. This is big work. It's hard work. It's going to be different for you and for you and for you as you share the peace of Christ. And it will not be over until Jesus comes again. But Jesus does call us Christians to be lights in this world, turning on Christ's light over and over again, even though the darkness will continue as long as the earth endures. We do not give up being people of peace, even though sin and its aftermath remain. So while we work for earthly improvements, do not forget where the real power is. The power that brings eternal results. That God gives us all we need to accomplish his eternal plans. That those sins that I admitted earlier in this sermon, they were forgiven and your sins are forgiven too. That is the power that God reveals in the gospel that make eternal differences. Go and make gather disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And yes, here we have the triune God. Through the waters of baptism, bringing people into God's family. It's part of the way that he answers this great need. That baptism saves whatever your sin, skin color whatever your race. When the Apostle Paul and Silas were foreigners unjustly imprisoned in the city of Philippi, an earthquake broke open their prison doors. But they did not run away when that would have meant death for the prison guard. Rather, they stayed and they answered the jailer's question, what must I do to be saved? I think you know the answer that they said. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved, you and your household. And the Bible explains that the whole family was filled with joy because they had come to believe in God. Baptism makes us people of peace. But there is more. 
Go and make disciples of all nations, teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. Jesus tells us to teach his word, and it includes all of his word, to stand up for those who are suffering, loving our neighbor according to the fifth commandment, respecting property, right? Taking care of our neighbor's property in addition to not stealing. Respecting the authorities that God has placed over us. While also calling those authorities to accountability as we are able. Yes, a lot is involved in everything Jesus has taught us. And so we dig deep, more deeply into that. Recognizing that all of this message is a message for the world. It begins with forgiveness in Jesus Christ for you and me. It leads to us forgiving others. And then it brings us to be people of peace, following God's law of love for him and love for our neighbor. Making disciples, gathering disciples, is more than gathering enough people in this church building so that we can pay the bills and continue to worship. Because making disciples, gathering disciples, means saving souls opening up eternal blessings. And how can we do that in this world in which we live? Consider how you may be a person of peace sharing Jesus Christ. And when that overwhelms you, and if you want to speak about it individually with own ideas of how it may apply to you and you and your station of life, I'm here for those personal visits. But it is overwhelming. And as you think about that, Jesus talks about gathering disciples of all nations. And while it's a message for West Laco and for all the valley, how can a small group, there's just a few people here today, how can we do that in the valley, which numbers a million people? It makes my knees shake to even consider that. But Jesus has given us everything necessary with the means of grace, baptism, and his word, his gospel of forgiveness, to be people of peace. And then when that still overwhelms you as the rubber hits the road and you go from this place living and being a person of peace, Jesus gives us a promise. Surely I am with you always until the end of the age. Jesus promises to go with us today and tomorrow, wherever that leads us, and there is great comfort in his promise, in this promise, that he's with us when we share the gospel. Because he does say go, but he doesn't tell you go alone. He goes with us. At this week's church council meeting, we spent a little time on a minor thing here at church. You see, there was an offer to donate electric candles for the altar because the uh, of the potential and how wax has dripped on our rug and on the altar with the wax candle lighter and we discussed that and that's a small thing and you may think why discuss something so minor with such big events going on around us it provided a teachable moment we reviewed what what the candles mean the light reminds us that Jesus is the light of the world. And the light is lit as the gospel is preached here because the word is light in this world. And it continues to shine. And yes, we talked about it. We plan to keep the current candles. We might work out ways to reduce dripping. We also want to include, include the youth in, in this meaningful way of participating in worship by being candle lighters. So we're not going to change the current candles to go to electric. But I also want to point out another candle here above me. Maybe you haven't noticed it before. It's an eternity candle or a chancel candle that is always lit. And yes, this one does happen to be electric. <laughs> it's plugged in. But it doesn't go off. <laughs> like the lamp in the tabernacle and temple of the Old Testament, 
It indicated the truth, and this reminds us of the truth that God in His Word continues to be with us. And so, you probably have never been here uh, after sunset on a dark evening in this church building where this and the exit lights are the only lights you can see. But to me, that is a meaningful moment when in this world of darkness, the light that represents God's word shining in darkness continues to light a dark place. Dear friends, as you are in this world and strive to be a light, a person of peace with the gospel of Christ, in this crisis in which we find ourselves in a nation, pray that that light continues to shine by God's grace, and pray that you may have a part in sharing the peace and forgiveness of Christ Jesus. Amen.